Courage and Gratitude, The Friendship of Maithros and Fingon, Tolkien Reading Day 2021. Do you have a friend who you would do anything for? A friend who you would defend against anyone, even your own family? Or who you would follow anywhere, even to the ends of the earth itself? Someone who you can forgive after a grave misunderstanding? Or who can forgive you? How would you feel if you suddenly lost that friend because of broader circumstances that are tragically out of your control? Well, the friendship of two particular characters from The Silmarillion by J.R.R. Tolkien can illustrate these very questions. It's a friendship that has always struck me precisely for its unlikeliness, but also for the courage and the grace of the characters involved. And these characters are the First Age Elves, Maithros and Fingon. This video is my contribution to Tolkien Reading Day this year, the theme being hope and courage. I believe that the incredible friendship of Maithros and Fingon fits this theme perfectly, so in this video I will examine the relationship of these two elves, especially the courage they show in trying times and the gratitude that they feel for each other's friendship and devotion. Now, if you haven't read the book The Silmarillion, What are you doing with your life? I'm just kidding. But you should probably stop watching this video and go read it because none of what I'm about to say is really gonna make any sense. Or if you're kind of short on time, watch my Silmarillion video series where I summarize each and every chapter of that lovely book using helpful pictures, maps, charts, and simple animations. Or better yet, read the book and watch my videos. Anyway, without further ado, Let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. Finwë is the high king of the Noldor in the land of Aman, and we are in the long years of the trees. When Finwë's Noldoran wife Miriel gives birth to their son Feanor, the fire and energy of Feanor's soul drains Miriel of her life, and she becomes so exhausted that her soul leaves her body never to return to it again. Finwë is grieved because he still wants more children, So, the Valar grant him permission to marry again. This time, he marries a Vanyaran elf called Indis, and together they have two sons, Fingolfin and Finarfin. However, Feanor had no great love for Indis, nor for Fingolfin and Finarfin. He lived apart from them, exploring the land of Aman or busying himself with the knowledge and the crafts in which he delighted. So basically, Feanor doesn't think very much of his younger half-brothers, and he doesn't really have anything to do with them. I'll wager that he views Indis with not a small amount of disdain, because she is not his mother, like she's trying to replace Miriel in Finwë's heart or something like that. And he's probably jealous of any attention that his beloved father gives to his brothers. Now, I have to mention something rather linguistic that really illustrates this familial rift, this tension. But the source that I'm going to use is actually not the Silmarillion, but rather a book called The Peoples of Middle-Earth, compiled and edited by Christopher Tolkien and published in 1996. It is the twelfth and final book in the grand book series called The History of Middle-Earth. Well, there's a chapter in The Peoples of Middle-Earth titled The Shibboleth of Feanor. And in case you don't know, a shibboleth is something like a custom that one group uses to distinguish itself from an otherwise similar group. The shibboleth of Feanor happens to be a linguistic feature that occurs in the Noldoran dialect of Quenya, or High Elvish. At some point in time, their dialect shifts from pronouncing th to s. However, since Miriel always pronounced it the old way, Feanor consciously decides to continue saying th instead of s. So instead of Miriel Serinde, he pronounces her name Miriel Therinde. Now you might be thinking, okay, who cares? Well, Finwë starts speaking the new way so that he can be similar to his people, and Indis just follows what he's doing. And this makes Feanor really angry because he views it as an insult to his mother's memory. So he judges people's loyalty from then on based on whether or not they say th instead of s. 
Now, Feanor marries the talented sculptor Nerdanel, and together they have seven sons, the oldest of whom is Maidros. He's called the Tall, and in comparison to other elves, that means he's exceptionally tall. I mean, why else would they feel the need to point it out, right? And his mother name, Maitimo, means well-shaped one. He was of beautiful bodily form. He has auburn, coppery hair like his mother, and he also takes after her in temperament, being more measured and patient than his hot-headed father. And as we will see going forward in the narrative, Maithros will prove himself generally wiser and nobler than his, most of his brothers, though obviously not wise enough to avoid catastrophe. But let's leave him for a moment and go over to the other branch of the family. Fingolfin is Feanor's younger half-brother, and although not as learned or talented in crafts as Feanor, he is nevertheless the strongest, the most steadfast, and the most valiant. And he certainly passes his characteristics on to his oldest son, Fingon, whose nickname actually is The Valiant. Uh, Fingon has dark hair, which he always wears in large braids weaved with gold. Now, Maithros and his younger brothers are raised pronouncing th instead of s, but Fingon and his siblings pronounce it s. And when Maithros and his brothers are children, they ask Feanor why their cousins talk differently. And Feanor just scoffs, bah, take no heed, we speak as is right, and as King Finwe himself did before he was led astray. We are his heirs by right and the Elder House. Let them sa see if they can speak no better. Oh, brother. So here they are, two cousins who share the same grandfather, but whose fathers are very, very different. You would think, you would think that Feanor would urge his sons to avoid hanging around with any of their lowly half-cousins, but this is not the case. For example, we see that Arevel, the daughter of Fingolfin, uh, Fingon's younger sister, loved much to ride and hunt in the forests. There she was often in the company of the sons of Feanor, her kin, okay? And another piece of evidence is that long before, in the bliss of Valinor, before Melkor was unchained or lies came between them, Fingon had been close in friendship with Maithros. Now, this is pretty remarkable. I mean, this friendship is highly unlikely, right? Why? Well, I'm sure when Maithros is growing up, he never hears his dad say anything positive about his uncle and cousins. Heck, he's even told that they don't talk correctly. And yet he chooses Fingon to be his friend, without any prejudice against him. And as you can see, no one is prevented from interacting with anyone else. I'm sure Feanor doesn't like it, but you can't, you know, you can't really force an elf to do anything he or she doesn't want to do. Even the Valar themselves can't keep the Noldor from eventually leaving Amon. So why would we expect it to be any different for cousins just getting together for a hunt or an occasional drink? And this was the noontide of the blessed realm, the fullness of its glory and its bliss. The Noldor advanced ever in skill and knowledge, and the long years were filled with their joyful labors. I mean, you only have the limits of your imagination to picture how great life must have been during this time. There's no Melkor, only Valar and elves hanging out. Think of the adventures, the fun, the joy. I like to think about the great celebrations and gatherings that I've been to in my life. You know, surrounded by friends, everyone's eating and drinking and laughing, just having an all-around great time. That's how I imagine the grand feasts of Valinor must be like. And Maithros and Fingon forge their relationship in this milieu. The Silmarillion states that Feanor and his sons abode seldom in one place for long, but traveled far and wide upon the confines of Valinor, going even to the borders of the dark and the cold shores of the outer sea, seeking the unknown. Now, I am positive that Fingon accompanies Maithros on some of these adventures, surely. I mean, maybe not while Maithros is traveling with his father, but uh, come on, at other times, I mean, heck, maybe Arathel comes along as well. We've been given enough evidence that would make, that they would make that assumption plausible, you know. Uh, the reason that I'm taking the time Time to give you all this kind of background context and draw a mental picture for you of where Maithros and Fingon start out is because it makes their friendship and the things that they go through later on all the more profound and significant. And of course, 
Good things cannot last long in a marred world. Melkor is set free from his imprisonment, and we know that he hates the Valar and the elves just as much as ever, especially Feanor, and he will stop at nothing to get his hands on those Silmarils. So he gets to work among the Noldor, spreading little lies and watching them grow, such as persuading them that the Valar are keeping them captive and preventing them from ruling their rightful lands in Middle-earth, yada yada yada. He sows mistrust among the elves towards each other, namely by convincing Feanor that Fingolfin and his sons plan to usurp his title as Finwë's heir. And he tells Fingolfin and Finarfin that Feanor plans to eventually drive them out of Tyrion, the capital city of the Noldor. Well, Melkor's lies are so powerful that they cause Feanor to recklessly threaten Fingolfin's life. With a sword! So after that little display, the Valar banish him from Tyrion for a while, and all his sons and Finwë follow him into banishment. Yikes, this whole episode has got to be awkward for Maedhros and Fingon, because Fingolfin is left to rule the Noldor in Tyrion. Which is exactly what Melkor told Feanor would happen, even though it's not Fingolfin's fault. So, you know, think about it. Fingon's dad takes over Maedhros' dad's job. Awkward. Why does he do it? Well, because Maedhros' dad threatened to kill Fingon's dad and he kind of got temporarily put on leave. Whoa, again, awkward. I mean, if you were either one of these guys... Surely your friendship would be at least a little strained. Uh, For example, the Silmarillion says, And the bitterness that Melkor had sown endured, and lived still long afterwards between the sons of Fingolfin and Feanor. But are Maedhros and Fingon absolutely included in this? I mean, do they really truly believe all the lies? I mean, maybe some of them, or maybe their moods are darkened a bit, but are the lies enough to destroy their deep and ancient friendship? Well, the answer is no, but we'll see the evidence as to why in just a little bit. I will come back to this. So after a while, Manwë holds a festival on Thaniquithil. Fingolfin pledges to follow Feanor wherever he goes, bad idea, and Melkor and Ungoliant kill the trees, kill Finwë, and scarper off with the Silmarils. Since Finwë is dead, Feanor now claims kingship over all the Noldor and convinces them to leave Amon. He then swears a terrible oath that he'll kill anyone or anything that stands between him and a Silmaril. His seven sons leapt straight away to his side and took the selfsame vow together. Maedhros is definitely getting swept up in that moment. And Fingolfin speaks up against Feanor because that oath is a terrible idea. Why would you do that? But Fingon actually doesn't see things the same way as his father. He wants to go to Middle-earth and see far-off lands and rule his own realm. Does he also not want to be parted from his friend? Eh, maybe, maybe. Although the book doesn't really say it outright. So he urges his father to go ahead, come on, let's go, even though Fingolfin goes against his wisdom in doing so. So, when everyone sets out, most of the Noldor don't actually want to follow Feanor as their king, instead preferring to follow Fingolfin. So they split into two groups, with Feanor's in the lead. But Fingon is right behind, eagerly leading the very front of the second group. And when the Feanorians start the kinslaying at Alqualonde, Fingon rushes in without knowing the real cause of the fight. Is he doing this to help Maedhros, or because he believes the Teleri are trying to stop the Noldor from leaving? I think it's a bit of both. On the one hand, we see the host of Fingolfin found a battle joined and their own kin falling. Okay, loyalty to kin, loyalty to friends, all right. But on the other hand, in the host of Fingolfin, some thought indeed that the Teleri had sought to waylay the march of the Noldor at the bidding of the Valar. Well, whatever the case may be, Fingon, along with Maedhros, are both guilty of the first evil act that elves commit in the story. This is not a good way to start exile. So once they get the ships, the Noldor head north. Mandos pronounces his doom, banning them from returning to Valinor and proclaiming their war against Morgoth is going to be totally hopeless. They press on anyway, 
But because there aren't enough ships to carry everyone at the same time, and since none were willing to abide upon the western coast while others were ferried across, Feanor and his sons do a really sneaky thing. They take the ships and slip away in secret so they can get there first. But when they were landed, Maedros, the eldest of his sons, and on a time the friend of Fingon, ere Morgoth's lies came between, spoke to Feanor, saying, Now what ships and rowers will you spare to return, and whom shall they bear hither first? Fingon the Valiant? Okay, so this little quotation is the first time that I really see how remarkable their friendship is. It may have been weakened over the past few years, or decades, or centuries, whatever, due to Morgoth's lies, but wow, it's pretty amazing for Maithros to still value his friendship with Fingon enough to ask Feanor if the ships will bring him first. I mean, Maithros obviously has a pretty strong will if he's able to resist not only Morgoth's falsehoods, but also his own father's prejudices and influence over his sons. I mean, think about it. Feanor's been able to influence Maithros enough to take a dreadful soul-damning oath, but he's not successful in passing on his, uh, you know, disdain for his younger brothers and their children. I think that's very interesting. So remember when I asked earlier if Maithros and Fingon really believe all the lies and are the lies enough to destroy their ancient fr friendship? Well, not for Maithros, apparently. Yeah, but let's continue. Then Feanor laughed as one fay, and he cried, None and none! What I have left behind, I count now no loss! Needless baggage on the road it has proved. Let those that curse my name curse me still, and whine their way back to the cages of the Valar. Let the ships burn. Then Maithros alone stood aside, but Feanor caused fire to be set to the white ships of the Tellery. I think it already takes a lot of courage for Maithros to bring up the subject of asking for ships to be sent back, but it takes a whole other level of courage to not participate in their burning. I mean, okay, so yeah, Feanor and Fingolfin do technically bury the hatchet at Manwe's festival, so maybe Maithros figures that it would be no issue to ask about sending back the ships, but still... He's pretty brave, because think about it. His father is the most fiery and amazing of all the elves to have ever lived. But right now, he's also gone completely bananas. I would imagine that Feanor is very intimidating and frightening in this scene in the book. I mean, shadows are probably grimly flickering across his menacing face by the light of hundreds of torches. That's scary. But now let's switch over to Fingon's point of view. And Fingolfin and his people saw the light afar off, red beneath the clouds, and they knew that they were betrayed. Oh boy, what an awful feeling. I mean, after hearing the horrible doom of the Noldor and their banishment from Amon, and then they go ahead anyway because they think that there's a future in this whole war for Morgoth, they get this far only to have their only source of transportation burned by the guys who they thought were their allies. I mean, Fingon most likely participated in the kinslaying, so he's already killed. This is a crime that he knows he must suffer for eventually. He, you know, you can't commit a crime in Arda without having to pay for it. So on top of that, now, as far as he knows, his best friend has betrayed him. I mean, this is really a low point, just this feeling of abandonment. I mean, not just for him, but for everyone. And despite that, okay, they push on, they cross the Hel Karakse, and there were vast fogs and mists of deadly cold, and the sea streams were filled with clashing hills of ice, and the grinding of ice deep sunken. This is a total nightmare. This is like hell on earth. People are dying. It is not an easy hopping from one ice flow to another. This is really grueling. In the meantime, the Feanorian host fights orcs in the Dagor Nuingiliath, and Feanor is killed. Then Maithros pretends to make a deal with some of Morgoth's representatives who overpower him and take him captive to Angband. Morgoth held Maithros as hostage and sent word that he would not release him unless the Noldor would forsake their war, returning into the west or else departing far from Beleriand into the south of the world. 
But the sons of Feanor knew that Morgoth would betray them and would not release Maedhros, whatsoever they might do. Therefore Morgoth took Maedhros and hung him from the face of a precipice upon Thangorodrim, and he was caught to the rock by the wrist of his right hand in a band of steel. He hangs in torment like this for about 20 years, by the way. So he is not a happy camper. So once the host of Fingolfin arrives in Middle-earth, they are none too happy with the way things have gone so far. No love was there in the hearts of those that followed Fingolfin for the house of Feanor, for the agony of those that endured the crossing of the ice had been great, and Fingolfin held the sons, the accomplices of their father. Yikes! So these are not ideal circumstances. The Noldor are going to be at each other's throats. The guy who started this whole exile thing went and got himself killed, and Maithros is a prisoner. I mean, things might seem pretty hopeless if not for the boundless courage and determination of Fingon, because he decides to try to heal this Noldoran feud, despite the fact that, though he knew not yet that Maithros had not forgotten him at the burning of the ships, the thought of their ancient friendship stung his heart. I mean, that's pretty amazing. He's going to go rescue his friend. Yes, for the practical purpose of bringing the Noldor together, but also because of his devotion and loyalty. I mean, you just you don't just waltz into Angband to save a friendly acquaintance, you know. And also, no one in the Noldoran host, in Fingolfin's host, is too happy with the House of Feanor, and now Fingolfin doesn't like them either. So, you know, it's just amazing that Fingon is like, no, no, my friendship matters more. I, I, I have to be loyal. I have to go save the day. So this evidence right here answers my previous question about whether or not Morgoth's lies are enough to destroy their ancient friendship. We've seen the answer is no for Maithros, and it's no for Fingon as well, apparently. I mean, this this is friendship right here. So he sets out alone and in secret, and when he arrives at Thangorodrim, he climbs up the mountains, just trying to find out where Maithros is being kept. Then his bravery causes him to take up his harp and sing. In the midst of the scariest, ugliest, nastiest place in all of Arda. I mean, this is Mordor on steroids, okay? And he dares to make beautiful music recalling the beauty and glory days of Valinor, when his and Maithros' friendship was strong and joyful. And then, oh, faintly, he hears a weak voice answer the song, and he looks up. Oh my god, you can imagine Maithros looks terrible and ragged and awful. Fingon actually weeps when he sees how Maithros has been tortured. And Maithros has lost hope and begs Fingon to kill him with an arrow. And Fingon, you know, he acquiesces, although not without making one last desperate plea to Manwe. I mean, this is a cry of desperation here. O king to whom all birds are dear, speed now this feathered shaft and recall some pity for the Noldor in their need. I mean, can you imagine having to do a mercy kill for your best friend? I, I, come on. No, you can't. It's, this, is, this is heavy stuff. But hope is not lost because Manwe answers. He hears the prayer and he answers by sending Thorondor, king of the eagles, to prevent Fingon from shooting. Hooray! Then he takes, then the eagle takes up Fingon to where Maithros is hanging, and Fingon cannot break the lock. He tries so many times and he just can't. Maithros once again begs him to kill him, but Fingon goes to the last resort. He cuts off Maithros's hand. And I'm sure that scream didn't sound bad. And they fly back to Mithrim, where all the Noldor are encamped. And that must have been quite an interesting entrance. I mean, you've got Fingon, who went out in secret, so no one knows where he is. People were probably like, hey, you see Fingon? Ah, I thought he was with you, right? And then you've got Maithros' scumbag brothers who don't even bother to go and rescue him themselves. And they see their supposedly inferior cousin, who can't even speak properly, rescuing their oldest brother in a triumphant return. I mean, wow. And Fingolfin may very well have been thinking, ah, oh, come on, son, why'd you go to all that trouble? He's an accomplice, don't you know? But whatever, by this deed, Fingon won great renown, and all the Noldor praised him, and the hatred between the houses of Fingolfin and Feanor was assuaged. 
So after Maithros recovers, he then acts out one of the most noteworthy gestures of gratitude in the entire book. He begs for forgiveness for running off with the ships, and he willingly relinquishes the high kingship of the Noldor to Fingolfin, the father of his rescuer. This is an extraordinary act of humility from someone of Maithros' social standing. Because remember, he's the eldest son of arguably the most remarkable, genius, glorious elf to have ever lived. And he is next in line to kingship. Which in a narrative like this, in its somewhat medieval setting, is not like how royal kinship is viewed in the modern era. Nowadays, at least in Europe, royalty are mostly just figureheads, they have no political power, and being related to a royal family is not the same as it once was in medieval times. You know, being the crown prince meant something back then. Power. Vicious wars were fought over the title of king back in the day. So you'll realize that Maithros' abdication is, wow, that's an incredible act of humility. I mean, this high and lofty being humbles himself. I'm convinced that it's at least in part due to gratitude to his friend. I mean, this also could have been a practical thing as an attempt to unite the Noldor. It could have been. It could have been. But I mean, come on. If just some rando rescued him... I, I, I'm not convinced that he would have done this. Yeah, no. And just a little note from the Shibboleth of Feanor, the S was certainly used in Beleriand by nearly all the Noldor. And it is not even certain that all Feanor's sons continued to use th after his death and healing of the feud by the renowned deed of Fingon, son of Fingolfin, in rescuing Maithros. Ha ha! I bet you dollars to donuts Mithros drops that th and takes up the s in his daily speech. So instead of saying, Fingon, you're my best friend, he would say, you're my best friend. <laughs> Boo. Anyway, Mithros' brothers are not happy with his abdication, but who cares what they think? He knows most of them are a little bit psycho, so much so that he moves his people out to the east of Beleriand, and that's the territory that they claim. It is said indeed that Mithros himself devised this plan to lessen the chances of strife, and because he was very willing that the chief peril of assault should fall upon himself, and he remained for his part in friendship with the houses of Fingolfin and Finarfin and would come among them at times for common counsel. Probably getting together, having a drink, talking about good old times, you know, the former glory days. And even though neither one of these characters has a happy ending in the story, I like to think that at least many, many years later, ages later, these two eventually become reincarnated and just hang out in Valinor until the end of the world. I mean, we don't know when or if they're reborn, or if one of them was and the other wasn't. We don't know that. Uh, but I think that with their personalities, they seem like they'd at least eventually be repentant, you know? But hey, that's just speculation. The point is, the scenes that I've highlighted here in this video are really what I think make for a compelling yet unlikely friendship that's just one of many great friendships in Tolkien's works. The courage, gratitude, loyalty, devotion. Maithros and Fingon embody these traits in relation to one another. And you know what? There's no th or s in the word melon. <laughs>